chapter number five. I'm going to start at verse number one. Uh, very familiar passage of scripture that I want to bring some nuggets to. King James Version, uh, John five, chapter number, excuse me, five, verse number one. After this, <laughs> after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went down to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem was a sheep market, a pool, which is called a Hebrew tongue, but that's the having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folks, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the move of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then, first after the troubling of the water, stepped into it was made whole, and whosoever of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had infirmities thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been there a long time in that case. And he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And the excuse from the impotent man was, Sir, I have no man when the water's troubled to put me in the pool. But while I was coming, another stepped in down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. The man wasn't healed. He was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I want to talk from this particular subject today, the allegory of the bed. I'll explain it more, but shout this with me with my subtopic, no more excuses. You can take your seats. You take your seats. The allegory of the bed. <laughs> the bed. The bed. Let me, let, let me start by saying this. An allegory is simply this. It is a picture or an object that can be interpreted uh, by the revealing of something that was hidden in it. It is simply a picture or an object of something that's hidden on the inside that can extract and find a revelation in it. As a matter of fact, in, in, in Plato's Republic, it is Socrates and the students that begin to teach a metaphor about the three beds, about there's three beds, there's the nature of the three beds, and why does the bed actually exist? As a matter of fact, it is believed that a great object or a great idea, it is at the intersection of these three three beds. It's an intersection of these three beds. And one of the idea of these three beds is called an idea. An idea, they said the bed is an idea, but you look a little further, it says this, it says that the idea should be nestled in the mind, which says to me that my mind should be a bed, which also implies my mind should be a resting place. If I took a poll right now, and decided to ask you a question. How many of you, your mind is your resting place? There will probably be a great deal of people in here that say, Pastor, truth be told, my mind is not my resting place. There's some wrestling that is going on in my mind that I cannot share with the people that are around me. And if the truth be told, it is Isaiah writings that said, he'll keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed. Wait a minute, wait a minute, stay. The word stay literally means to lean into. <sighs> he said, if you lean into what I said, I'll give you a resting place. The problem with some of us is we're leaning in the wrong direction. 
it is the idea that should be the resting place. Another bed they talk about is not only the idea, it is the imagination. It is the imagination that Socrates began to teach. How do we imagine things? It is depicted like a painting. How do we draw our lives? How do we want it? Can you imagine taking an empty canvas and beginning to paint what you believe God told you that was going to be for you? The dreams that we said that we want to come to pass. And Socrates began to teach, and I thought about the Bible. And he says, let the eyes of my understanding be enlightened. Wait, wait a minute. Which means my understanding has eyes. <sighs> Which means no matter what's happening in my life, if I can understand that God is in control, I can see my way out of it. And the problem with some of us is we can't see our way out of it because we don't know what God is saying. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is the idea. The third bed, it is the creation. The allegory of the bed is the creation. In the creation, it is molded by the craftsman. And I thought about Jeremiah chapter 18. When the Bible says he was in the potter's house. And God is saying to some of us today, being confident of this very thing, he that begun a good work in you, he's going to accomplish it. He's going to accomplish it. Somebody shout, I'm becoming new. Yeah. I'm becoming new, which means he's still working on me. <laughs> there are some elements in my life that I have to be absolutely honest with you, Pastor, that I'm still fighting with, I'm still struggling with. And I'm tired of living in a day and time now where I gotta act like everything is okay all the time. Sometimes in my life, I feel like I'm being frustrated. I believe the greatest deliverance that could ever happen in your life comes from you. It is the craftsman, it is the craftsman that now brings us to John chapter number five, to this text that we're all so familiar with. But the Bible says, after this, Bishop was talking and I told the guy, I said, if he doesn't get out of my message, I think I'm gonna scream. Because in verse number one, he says, after this, with the allegory of the bed, he says, after this, there was a feast. Well, let's have a quick Bible study. There were three feasts that it was mandatory that they had to attend. One was the Feast of the Tabernacle. One was the Feast of the Tabernacle. One was the Feast of Pentecost. You know it is 50 days when we celebrate. And the other one is the Feast of the Passover. Well, I want to argue that this is the Feast of the Passover. Can I please fast forward and make you understand what the feast of the Passover is. It is in the book of Exodus that they find themselves in a land that craziness is happening. It is in this place where God says, put the blood on the doorpost and the death angel will pass by your house. Please forgive me for you modern day Christians I absolutely love you, but mother, I still believe the blood still works. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm trying not to get too excited early, but I still believe the blood still works. As a matter of fact, I hear my grandmama, I know you young ones, I got you. I still hear my grandmama say, the blood, 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 the blood. Put it in the comment, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. When I can't think of anything to say, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. I plead the blood over my kids. I plead the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Okay. There's power in the blood. The blood, the blood. I don't know who this is for, the blood. The blood, the blood over your children, the blood over your money, the blood over your house, the blood over everything you've been thinking, the blood, the blood, the blood. blood. Mama, you standing cause of the blood. You're still here cause of the blood. They have no idea.
Bishop, I asked God the question. Why in Ezekiel was the deaf angel able to shoot, pass by the blood? Why was he able to pass? He said, son, you don't understand. I told him I put the blood on the doorpost. It is the entry point. And the devil, watch this, catch this, could not see beyond the blood. Okay, okay, okay. That, that's enough to shout all by itself. He didn't say, I don't care what's going on in the house. He said, the blood will cover what's in the house. I didn't ask the house to be perfect. I just asked the house to be covered by the blood. And I don't know who this is for today, but God said, I don't need your house to be perfect. I just need it to be covered by the... <laughs> the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. See, this is why I believe, you know, sit down please, the person behind you can't see. <laughs> the blood, the blood, the blood. See, it is, it is this. It is this allegory of the blood. And I ask God the question, I say, once again, why the blood? What was the instructions? He said, because I covered the firstborn. Catch this. So everything you're giving birth to is covered. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Everything that manifested in your life, you can be right here in the potter's house. You can be online, and God said the blood is covering everything you're getting birth to. And everything God says you're getting ready to deliver in this next season of your life. Don't ask me for stuff. Ask me to cover what's coming forth. And I need God to cover everything that I'm getting ready to give birth to. Church, we only in verse number one. The text says that he's at the feast. And as he's on his way to the feast, he runs across this city. That's not what the Bible said, that's what I said. <laughs> he comes to this city, as we know it, called Bethesda. It is at Bethesda, y'all, that he finds this pool. But before we talk about the pool, Bethesda, I don't want to insult anybody's theological construct, but the, Bethesda literally means the house of mercy. It's, and it's called the house of mercy because it is there that God would provide healing and restoration. So he says, catch this, I'm going to put sick people in a place called mercy. <laughs> and their assignment in a mercy place is to wait for a move of God. Okay, 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 okay. I missed it the first time too. So he puts sick people in a place called mercy. <laughs> and the only thing they're doing is waiting on the move of God. Okay, I missed it the second time too. <laughs> Just elbow the person next to you and say, you got some issues. You, have, he, you, you got some issues now. It might not be the same issues I have. But we're all in the house of mercy with our crazy self waiting on a move of... <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on a move. Oh God, pastor, say something. Praise team, say something. Bishop, say something. Because all I need is one word to confirm what God has already told me. And baby, I'm off to the races. I don't need to convince everybody. All I need is one word. So the Bible says there's sick people in one place looking for a move of God. 
But this is what caught my attention. The Bible says that there are five pillars that are there. I won't even talk about. They're in a house of mercy covered by five pillows. Okay, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> They're in a house of mercy surrounded by five pillows. And if you know anything about numerical value, the number five is grace. So they're in a place of grace and mercy. And God says, I still got you covered. Kiss this. <laughs> Let me say this that may, may make some of you mad and I still love you. You cannot be healed and God still provides grace and mercy. <laughs> See, this is when I can judge mature Christians. I don't need God to do it for me. The fact that he has me in a place of grace and mercy, baby, that's more than enough all by itself. So if you never do anything else for me again, the fact that you have me in the right place at the right time, that his grace and his mercy. See, we gotta stop all this asking God for tangible things. That's fine, that's fine. That's fine. I'm believing God for a new car. You don't need to believe God, just get your credit right. You gotta believe God for that. It's simple. Execution. Do what you're supposed to do. You'll get it together. God said, why are you asking me to do something you can do yourself? But what you can't do is provide yourself grace and mercy. So what I'll do is put you in a place to where only I can get all the glory and his grace and... Wait a minute. Wait a minute, so... I'm, I'm exploring this text and I'm like, wait a minute, God. You're providing grace and you're providing mercy. But the text says there's five grace pillars. Uh, Bishop said it and I'm gonna kind of reiterate it. Uh, we, we are new Texans. We, we moved here. We, we moved here from Florida and uh, absolutely love the state. But there is one thing that is absolutely unforgiving about Texas. Jesus Christ! I'm not using the Lord's name in vain, please forgive me. Don't write in about that. But this heat! Oh my God! I woke out the house the other day and started saying, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. So, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I walked out the house and said, Lord, please don't send me to hell. Please don't send me. I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be funny. But Texas weather is unforgiving. And it doesn't care. It doesn't discriminate. It don't care if you're rich, poor, broke, Republican, Democrat. It does not care at all. This heat said, listen, we rain on the just as well as the unjust. We don't care. I walked out the house and started taking short breath. <laughs> What's going on here? I've never seen such a thing in my life. <laughs> Bishop, almost God, did I make the wrong move? Jesus Christ, am I a punishment? No, but I love it. We fell in love, and the first thing my wife did, the first thing we did was, we didn't go to a mall, we looked for shade. <laughs> Find me a tree, let me stand in it. God bless us with a car, I was cranking the car before I got to it, like listen, let it be cool before I get to the car. Lord have mercy, but just this, catch the revelation. This weather is so unforgiving, but Lord, the Lord said, I'm in the text also because he says I provided five pillars. And I always thought pillars were just columns that stood. I didn't understand the columns stood and covered. So not only am I providing grace and mercy, I'm providing covering with your sick self. Wait, 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 wait. Which means you cover me? Even when I'm sick, you cover me even though I don't have it all together. Now, this may be only for 10%. This may be only for the e-church and real people. I am so glad God does not hook me up to the TV screen and let y'all see what I really 
would be like if it was not for the covering of the blood. Now, I know everybody can't tell the truth, but there's some of us that's in here that say, God, thank you for covering me. Thank you they didn't find out. Thank you my job looked over it because the truth be told, catch this, I don't praise God cause I'm crazy. I praise him for keep him going crazy. <laughs> Somebody shout, he covered me. Don't you look at me with that tone of voice. <laughs> Somebody shout, he covered me. Yeah. Oh, you are a mess up, Ty. Oh, he covered me. Not, not last year, not 10 years ago. He covered me yesterday. He covered me the day before yesterday. He covered me on the way to church. Well, I... <laughs> Lady, he didn't heal me, but he covered me. That ought to be enough to make the church shout all by itself. He didn't heal, but he covered me. He didn't deliver when I wanted him to, but he covered. The text says, they're in grace, they're in mercy, and they're covered. But they're waiting on a move of God, but not recognizing that God is already in control. <laughs> Which means God will provide comfort even in chaos. <sighs> You, you, do, you do know God can be providing in one area of your life and you can be lacking in another area of your life. You do know you can be happy in one area of your life. You can be perfectly fine in one and the other area of your life feel like it's going crazy. You do know in one hand you can be absolutely okay and the other hand you can be absolutely going crazy. I know, I know sometimes we gotta hide it from people because they expect us to be perfect. They expect that, oh, you're a Christian. What does that mean? That means I'm supposed to have it together? No, that simply means I got grace, mercy, and I'm covered. That still don't mean I ain't sick. That still don't mean I ain't got some areas in my life I ain't about to go crazy. Baby, don't let this Christianity get you twisted. It's because of him that I'm covered. Okay. It's because of him. It's because of him. He provided grace, he provided mercy. He gives us comfort in chaos. It's this, this, this whole season is chaotic. Huh. Things are fine, but he's saying, watch this. He says, I'm covering you in your mess. The text says in verse number three, at this pool lay a great multitude, and then he gives the description of who's in the church. I'm sorry, at the pool. He gives a description of who you sit next to. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He gives a description. Because remember, all y'all just shouted over grace and mercy and covering. Baby, which is an indication of what we're in the pool. And he gives, he gives adjectives <laughs> to describe. And the first thing he says is impotent folks. The word impotent, that literally means to have no power. You have no, you have no power. Can I pause for one second? Have you ever been in a season in your life where you feel like you ain't have no power? I'm talking, you praying, believing God, paying your tithe, asking God to move, and it seems like nothing is happening. As a matter of fact, he's doing it more for the people that you're praying for than it seems like he's doing it in your life. And it seems like I'm impotent, I ain't got no power. It is there we find ourselves interested. And then he says, there are blind people there. They're blind. Well, I'm so glad he does not give the description of blind. Because there's legally blind. <laughs> Truth be told, you're looking at me now, you would know I have contacts on. If I take these contacts off, I might be able to see who in the front row. What's this? So I understand my blindness. So I need tools to help me see further off. Okay, okay, okay. Without the proper tools, I can't see the future. So every now and then, 
I need the Holy Ghost to be my glasses. Okay, okay. I told you this is a little old school. I need him to be my contact lenses and say, I'm nearsighted. I'm farsighted. God, please help me with the adjustment of my eyes. And God is saying for some of you today, I've already made a way out. You need to adjust how you see things. Because when you can see clear, you can make proper decisions. Why do you think your license have your, okay. They wanna know when the police pull up. Okay, you supposed to be wearing glasses. Where's your eyewear? <laughs> That's so not only are they blind, not only they have no power, the Bible says they also, they're halted, they're withered which means I have no circulation. There's no blood. There's no blood. <laughs> and where there's no blood, there is no growth. Okay, I'm... <laughs> the problem with some of you is you want to grow, but the blood can't flow. And I'm not talking about your blood. God says, I need you to grow in the direction I want you to grow in. So you need a blood transfusion that can cause something to grow in your life. Because it's still the allegory of the bed. We're still talking about who's at the pool. Who you sitting next to? Who's in this house? And I know you look beautiful with your wonderful looking self. To the people in the balcony, always to the front row, you look so good. But you have some issues. I know we do well at hiding it, but you have some issues. And it is here where we begin to rest. And the Bible says, and Jesus sees him afar off. The text says he saw him. Wait a minute. He, Jesus don't have an eye problem. What do you mean you saw him? There's a multitude of people that are at this pool, and the only person you saw was him? And I almost got mad with God until I looked up the word saw. Huh. Until I found out the word saw literally means to look with a future mindset. Okay, 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 okay. So he saw a man lying there and saw his future. Pause, pause, I'm confused, I'm confused. Everybody that's laying here has a problem but you only saw the future of one man laying in the middle of a crowd. Here's why some of you should have been dancing and going crazy, because God will find you in the middle of a crowd. God will find you in the middle of graduation. God will find you in the middle of your job. He said, I, I see you. Uh, uh, I see you, I see you, but Dr. Oscar, here's where I got the problem. It's that you're in grace, you're in mercy, you have covering, and none of the sick people recognize Jesus is here. You mean to tell me I can come to church and watch everybody dance and shout and not even recognize? He was in the room. I refuse to waste my time trying to live to the parallel of people. And I miss God because he showed up. And I'm sitting here trying to make you happy? Are you crazy? As a matter of fact, tell somebody, I'm not here for you. I need to hear a voice from the Lord. I need to hear something in this season of my... I need, I need to hear something. But here's why I need to hear something, because the text also said that there's the cripple that's there. Which means these people can walk where they walk with a limp. So they can move, but they walk with a limp. Oh, Bishop, here's why I began to shout again. Because there's people moving all around you. And it look like they're going somewhere. But God got his eyes fixed on you which says to me, there's nothing that somebody else can do around you that can block God from seeing you. What God has for me, baby, it's for me. 
come hell or high water. I don't care who moving. I don't care who has the promotion. I don't care who got the new job. I don't care who has a new husband. When God... Somebody shout, it's for me. It's... Texas. He sees him. He sees him in the middle of a crowd. Huh. Here's why I got a little excited. He said he sees him. And the next thing he says is, will you be made whole? Wait, Jesus sees him, but how did he get to him? If he sees him, he has to get to him. Which literally means he has to step over people to get to where you are. And I don't know who this is for today, but God says I'm in the stepping business. I'm about to step over people who you thought were going before you, and I'm getting ready to find you laying there. You don't have to move. All I have to do is... Somebody shout, he sees me. He sees me. Oh, I felt that. Well, somebody shout, he sees me. He sees me. That's all I need to know is that he, he sees me. Huh. But, 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 but in verse number four, there's this pragmatic shift. And he says, for when an angel went down during a certain season, the angel troubled the water, huh. which says to me that the people are there waiting on a move, which speaks to the level of expectation in spite of their flaws. So in other words, I don't care how sick I am, I'm expecting God to do something in my life. I don't care what I've been dealing with, I'm expecting God to do something in my life. The lady that just raised her hand in the balcony, God says, I'm going to step across and I'm about to do something in your life. God said, you don't think I see you way up there? Baby, I see you. And I'm about to step across some stuff. And eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it. I'm about to... I see, this is, it also says to me, there's not just expectation, there's a level of hunger. What says to me, I'm hungry for God to do something. <laughs> and I don't like to talk to people who fool, because usually we get lazy when we fool. But I wish I had some hungry Christians that said, I need another championship in my life. I need God to move again in my life. I need God to do something again in my life. Don't tell me how you won last season. Tell me what we gonna do in the next season. Somebody shout, I'm hungry. Oh, oh, excuse me. Here's what I found out about being hungry. When you're hungry, every now and then, your insides start making some noises. Okay, okay, you missed it. You missed it. Have you ever been hungry and your stomach start growling and somebody next to you say, oh, excuse me. I need to get something on the inside. Can I talk to about a thousand people in here and another 10 on the internet? Somebody say, excuse me. That's just my inside. Give me God praise. Because I know I'm about to eat something. I know God is getting ready to feed me. And he's gonna give me everything that I need. Okay. Somebody shout, I'm hungry. So, so when I say, that I'm hungry, it reminds me of the scripture. He says, as the deer panted after the water brook, so does my soul. You do understand, he said, as the deer panted after the water brook, so does my One of the misconceptions that we get is that the deer is running to the water just to drink. 
The deer doesn't run to the water just to drink. That's only one-sided. The deer also understand that I'm being hunted. And the enemy that's hunting me can only sense me by smell. So I'm not trying to get to the water just to drink. I'm trying to get to the water so I can get, so I can dip in the water. Okay, okay, I'm not even gonna bother that. <laughs> and the problem with some of us today is that we don't want to drink from Jesus. See, when the deer says, I understand that the enemy is chasing after me, baby, I need to submerge. Because when I get in the water, I understand he can't hide, I can't find me anymore. It is. So I did a little more research to find out what happens when the deer gets into the water. The water removes all of the stint of where it came from. <laughs> the water, when I get to the water, come here, pool, when I get to the water, when I get in, he washed away everything. Wait, what can wash away my, okay, okay, my sin? Nothing but the, there it is again, there, 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 there it is again. Baby, you want to be forgiven? Learn how to wash. You see, most of us come on church on Sunday looking for a drink. I come because I've been dipped. So as the deer panteth after the water brook, so does my soul long for to get rid of my stint of yesterday. <sighs> and most of us want to move into tomorrow smelling like yesterday. <laughs> so I said, why? 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 Why is this happening? 38 years this man has been here. That seems unjust. 38 years you've been laying in this place? Wait a minute, I did some math. Jesus only in the world for 33 years. So he had this issue before Jesus was even born. So he had this issue not knowing that Jesus was in a discussion with his father that say, send me, I'll go. So he had this issue before he even understood that Jesus, wait a minute, it, does, it doesn't seem fair because it seems like for 38 years somebody would have helped this man before. Can I pause right there for just one second? Just because somebody in your circle, that does not mean they want you to advance before them. Let me, let, let me give you a dose of reality. And then I got mad with Jesus. I said, why didn't you show up for that man earlier? He said, I couldn't show up in year 36. Why? He said, I couldn't show up in year 37. I said, why? He said, there wasn't enough glory attached to it yet. And maybe God has you in this situation till he gets some more glory attached to it. He says, I can't take you out just yet because I need some more glory attached to it. Why? Because the enemy thought you couldn't make it, but the devil is a liar. You on year 37, heading into year 38. Baby, he's about to show up and you didn't even deserve it. He said, I needed, I needed some more glory attached to that. I said, I don't understand. You need some more glory attached to it. He said, yeah, because when I saw him, it wasn't right yet. When I saw him, it wasn't right yet. I used this example before. I'm going to use it again. I'm not much of a baker. Bishop, that is all of you. The ability to bake. But I, had, I found this out in baking. I literally did. I'm not much of a baker, but I watched my mother and my mother-in-law bake. And they do it with such pristine that I thought you had to put the cake on a timer. I said, what you, the box say? She said, don't bring me no box cake. I'm like, okay. 
I feel Bishop looking at me like I lost my mind. I wish you would put a box cake up in here. <laughs> I said, well, okay, help me with understanding. So when they finished mixing and putting everything together, I thought 15, 20 minutes, we should be good. I looked at the outside of the cake and it looked good. I turned that light on and it looked good. I said, oh, that thing is ready. She said, it ain't ready yet. I said, what you got a sensory? What you got a Holy Ghost cake baker? What are you, what are you talking to? It ain't ready yet. What do you mean it ain't ready? It looked ready. She said, do me a favor. I said, but it has risen. It is brown. It looked good. She said, you so nosy. Do me a favor. Open it up. Grab a toothpick. Why didn't you clean my teeth off or something? She said, no, 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 no. Stick the toothpick in the middle of the cake. That was so crazy to me. I'm thinking, I'm going to mess the cake up. She says, boy, stick the toothpick in the cake. I stuck the toothpick in the cake and I pulled it out. And she said, look at the toothpick. But I wanted to look at the cake. She said, no, look at the toothpick. I said, what do you mean? Why am I looking at the toothpick? She said, is there anything stuck on the toothpick? I said, yeah, it's still some residue on it. She said, then it ain't ready. And maybe God can't give you what you need because every time he stick you, you got residue of yesterday. And he said, no, you ain't ready yet. No, you ain't ready yet. He says, when I stick you, there's no residue of yesterday. That's okay. <laughs> Somebody shout, it won't stick. Okay. I learned something that day, Bishop. I learned it didn't matter how the oven was and what I looked like on the outside. God says, I can't serve you properly if your inside's not done. Oh, I, can't, I can't serve you up because in year 37, you're still stuck. I asked him, I said, then how do you know this man is stuck? When did you stick him? He said, I stuck him with the question. Will you be made whole? And the first thing you told me about was your past. Every time I go, can I be Ebonic? I ain't got nobody to put me in. Do you not realize who's standing in front of you? You're talking to the future, complaining about your past. And he said, I stuck him with the question. Catch this. And the answer is the revelation of your limited knowledge. I don't have nobody to put me in. And I'm sorry, that's no more excuses for somebody in church. I don't have nobody to help me with my credit. I don't have nobody to help me with these kids. I don't have nobody to help me. Baby, you better tighten up your own bootstraps and say in this season of my life, I'm going to have to do it alone until God provides. Wait a minute. I'm never alone because he said he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He said, the first thing you do is you tell me about your problem. You tell me I ain't have nobody to put me in. So watch this. This is a revelation of your mental trauma. You stuck. Can I, can I please say this? Please don't let comfortability become your permanent address. Oh. Please don't let being comfortable become the permanent place of where you think God wants you to be. Because the text says, he says when he saw him laying there that he had been there a long time. Now, I got another question. How do you know he's been there a long time? Jesus, you just showed up. What you talking about? He's been there a long time. You ain't been there for two minutes. I know you omnipresent, omnipotent. How do you know he's been there that long? How do you know? And then he said, son, I can tell you how he's been there long. I said, why? He said, look at the indention in his bed. 
My wife and I are totally opposite. Opposite in every area. I wanted 60 degrees, she wanted 81 degrees in the house. She want her bed side of bed one way, I want my side of bed the other way. So she talked me into buying this doggone mattress. Every time I get in the mattress, it fold me up. I'm like, Jesus, and she get in it and she's just fine. This so comfortable, no, it's not. This bed, and every time I get out, it just pop back into place for her. And for me, I always see my indentures. I like, look, I can tell which way I was laying. <laughs> Watch this, because I had been laying there for so long. You can lay in a season of your life for so long that it becomes an indention of your mind that you think 2005 is what all God wants for you. That you think 2002 is all God wants for you. And every time he tells you to get up, he sees the indention of where you've been laying because you made comfortable your permanent address. And he says, why, why, why are you asking me with this crazy question? Do I want to be made whole? Man, are you crazy? Look, why you think I'm here? Why, I've been here for 38 years. You think I don't want to be made whole? Have you lost your mind, Jesus? Why do I want to be made, do I want to be made whole? Man, why you think I'm, and I, I believe, I believe. Jesus now starts his conversation because he said, that everybody that's watching is about to be mesmerized. Because I'm going to do something that has never been done before in the eyes of people who never seen it before. Catch this. And I'm about to use somebody who they was least expecting that I was going to use. Can I park right there for just one second? God says, I'm about to use somebody who everybody else walked away from. You thought I should have been there the whole time, but God said, this one is for you. Catch this, y'all. I got I to gotta get here. I got to get here. The text says this. He says, I have nobody put me there. And every time I go to get in, somebody, somebody move in before me. Well, okay, okay, wait a minute. Every time I go to move in, somebody move in before me. But the text says this is an impotent man, which means he's supposed to have no power, which means sometimes he try to pull his own self in but he can't move fast enough before somebody else move in before you. So he has excuses on top of excuses on top of excuses. But here's my shout. Jesus never responds to him again by his answer. Okay, okay, okay. He says, rise, take up your bed and walk. I don't want to shout right there. I want to shout in revelation he gave me. He says, I'm trying to teach you because you're responding to the wrong water. You're waiting on a pool, not realizing that the pool is in front of you. Don't believe me? Moonwalk with me back one chapter. Because in John chapter 4, there was a woman that he meets at the well that has a water problem. And the woman say, I want that water, but I ain't got nothing to draw from. He said, baby, if you drink from me, you won't have a problem no more. So he's trying to teach you in chapter number four, this is a water problem. He's trying to teach you in chapter number five, this is a water problem. Don't respond to the water, respond to the word. Don't tell me about the pool because you think the pool is the answer. The answer is standing in front of you. And some of you are missing it because you're waiting on the pool to move. Well, the word is already moving. Okay, let me, let me unpack this a little further. He says, I don't have nobody to put me in. Jesus says, rise, 
take up your bed and walk. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Which means now you have to respond to the command of what she said. You got to realize, do I believe in what the water used to do? Or do I hold on to what the word is telling me to do? Because the water only worked for one person. But the word works for everybody. Listen, I, I don't know who this is for today, but I couldn't have been at that pool. There's no way I could have been in that pool because just as sure he was a told that impotent man to rise up, I'd have said he might not have been talking to me, but I heard the word. <laughs> he might not have been talking to me, but I'm too hungry. Now you may not respond to it. That's why I don't have time to let my neighbor praise him because I'm not codependent on your praise. Baby, I'm taking advantage of what he's saying in the atmosphere. Somebody shout, take advantage. Uh, you, you, you better take advantage of what God is saying. Because a person that loves you will challenge you. I can't love you and keep you where you are. I have a problem with people who winning and say they're friends, but they're friends losing. Okay, that's, that's too much flesh, that's too much flesh. That's too much flesh, that's too much flesh. Because my wife know my rules. If I'm eating at the table, everybody eating at the table. If you going with me, everybody gonna win. There's no way in the world I'm gonna be winning and I'm not gonna challenge you to be better. There's no way in the world I'm gonna be winning and I'm gonna challenge you to let you stay in a losing place. There's no way in the world. Mike, but I found this out too now. I might challenge you to be better, but some people just like being broken, Bishop. Here's what I found, Auntie, I found this out. Sometimes people like being broken because they like the attention that broken gets them. I'm broke, I'm broken, look at me, I'm broken. Look at me. I'm sick and tired of listening to people. I'm broken. Look at me. Child, and fix yourself. I'm broken. Look at me. Catch this. Can I, can I please say this? Broken people, please stop getting mad at people when they fixed and they leave you. Now, if you're broken and say, I want to get better, come on, let's go. Because I'm going to challenge you to be better. But if you like, in other words, here's what's broken. I call you every day and you complaining. You broken. Every time we talk about what happened to you in 2002, baby, you broken. You have the indention of the bed that is still broken in your mind of the allegory of the bed that you have found the place to rest where God does not want you anymore. Check this. Text, he says, rise, take up your bed and walk. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. Do you want to be made whole? See, there's a difference between healing and whole. See, being healed is the ability to move. Being whole is the ability to produce. See, I don't need to be in a season of my life where I'm moving again. I need to be a season of my life where I'm producing again. I need to make sure I can make it through. This, this, and Bishop, I, I found this out. Oh, I'm about to shout my own self crazy. I found this out. He says, take up your bed and walk. After 38 years, he says, take up your bed and wait. He walked, my dog, you gotta help me. After 38 years, what's your muscle memory? What? Where's the rehab? Where's the therapy? Where's the surgery? God said, I'm about to skip seasons. Well, other people, it took six months of recovery. It's about to take you eight, eight seconds of listening to rise, take up your bed, and... 
Now I'm about to get happy right here because he did not say walk amongst the people that are healed. He says walk past people who are still suffering with illness. In other words, baby, God's about to heal me. I ain't blocking up. Stop texting your friends and telling them bye. Text your haters. I ain't telling nobody bye ever again. Tell your haters, see you later. No. No. Watch what God is getting ready to do in my life. I don't care if you hate me, don't like me, like me, love me. I want everybody to be present when he watched the manifestation of he's about to skip seasons and eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, okay? Woo. Bishop, I thought about something. I said, this is my season that I'm about to walk into everything God has for me. Somebody shout, walk in it, walk in it, walk in it, walk in it. Take my bed. And I'm walking up out of here. Everybody that don't like me, I'm taking up my bed and I'm getting out of here. I got a toddler bed and I'm getting up out of here. I'll see y'all later. Bye bye. Bye bye. I ain't here no more. But I see y'all. That's what I've been laying on. I've been here for 38 years. Wait a minute. I've outgrown. I got a question, mama. Why is a king size anointing laying on a toddler bed? Why is your queen size anointing still laying with toddlers? What is a toddler bed? Somebody who thinks too small. I wish I had somebody that realized They've been sleeping in a small space to run down to this altar and say, I have no more excuses. I have no more. Then I realized the bed wasn't a bed. The bed was a cocoon. It was when I realized I can't lay here anymore. I have to spread my wings. 
I don't have time. Who will explain? This is too small. Where I've been, it's too small. The way I've been thinking, it's too small. Come here, PT. Elevate your conversation. We've been thinking too small. Jesus says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Jeffrey, I was okay. If he says, rise and walk, that was a miracle within itself. He didn't just say rise and walk. He said, get up. Grab your bed and walk. In one season of my life, I said, why am I carrying this bed? You're right, preacher. He said, everything that had been carrying you, I'm about to carry it. But let me give you another revelation God gave me. God also said to me, there are people in your life who have been beds. And when I bless you in this next season, you better make sure you don't leave them behind. You better make sure you carry them. While it may be too small, don't forget about it. Grandmama may seem to be too small, but her prayers was the one that got you through. Mama may not be like, mama may not want the big house, but don't forget about the small things because I always took the bed as a negative connotation. But when also he says, don't, don't leave it behind. So God, why don't you leave it behind? He said, because what happens is, don't leave the people nothing to talk about. Don't give them nothing to talk about. They can't say, oh yeah, a certain man was laying there. Why? Because the blood was on the doorpost. Where you laid is an empty spot. Wait a minute. Where Jesus laid after three days was an empty spot. And today, we say no more excuses. Because <laughs> if you study Plato's Republic, as Socrates is teaching, Socrates decides to add a fourth one in. He talks about the image, he talks about the idea, he talks about the creation. And Socrates enters a fourth one, Benny, and he calls it the usage of the bed. <sighs> so in other words, what used you last season? So when Bishop said, your enemy's gonna bless you, I don't know who this is for, but over the next seven days, God's about to use people to bless you in ways you could not imagine. God's about to use people who did not like you, who may have talked about you last season, son, who may have tried to dog you. God's about to open the door for you. And God says, I want you to count yourself worthy of what I'm getting ready to do for you. Don't you disqualify yourself from what God did. He, you know why God said it? He said, because I see you. When daddy didn't see you, I see you. <laughs> he said, I, I see you. So Father, today, we follow your instructions. We have no more excuses. We're gonna rise, take up our bed, and walk. Because we realize a king should not be laying on a toddler's bed. The queen in you 
should not be laying with toddler people. Your mind should be the resting place that I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. That everything the enemy meant for evil, God is going to turn it for the good. I refuse to lay here anymore. So everyone that's under the sound of my voice, everyone that's watching, everyone that's tuned in, I speak a rehab anointing on your life. That what the enemy meant for evil, I don't care if you've been laying that for 38 years or 38 minutes. Rise, take up your bed and walk. <laughs>